we are live, amen, and we're thankful to be able to be live this Father's Day. I want to say Happy Father's Day to all the, the dads out there who are listening to us, and uh, and I would urge you, as I posted on Facebook this morning, to be a leader and take your children to church, take your family to church. Lead your family in spiritual matters. Get them interested in the Lord. What am I doing with the songbook? I don't need a songbook. I need the Bible. Amen. All right. I guess I thought I was going to sing something else. I don't know. I had my mind elsewhere. Take your Bible this morning. Turn to chapter 5 of Matthew. Um, <clears throat> you'll never regret leading your family in the ways of the Lord, even if they don't follow. Even if they don't follow. May, people may get discouraged trying to lead their family in the ways of the Lord, and they don't want to follow. It won't be a dad standing there giving an account for the children. The dad won't have to stand there and give an account for what the children have done. No, the children are giving an account for themselves. The dad will give an account for whether or not he led his children to follow the Lord. So do it. Do it, and you'll never have to apologize to God. Amen? I want to get us back into our study. We're in part 34 of, of getting to know Jesus, and uh, we, we've talked quite a bit uh, on a lot of different subjects. But last week, we kind of left off in the middle of something, and uh, we'd have to look back here to, uh, to verse 17, chapter 5, to hear Jesus say, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And, you know, if, I can see why they might think he had come to destroy the law if they had believed up to this, this point that they had to keep the law in order to please God. And certainly that's what the Pharisees were implying. The Pharisees, which is all the religion that they had had, understand that, for, for at least uh, 400 years or more, the people had been apostate. They'd been apostate longer than that, but folks, they, Israel had gone downhill. I mean, they'd become just a shell of what they were before when Christ came into the world. Um, they were under Roman occupation. They were uh, <clears throat> very much a secular society. With a with the trappings of religion, but yet they had no they had no hope in their religion because most of them had had uh, had cast off waiting for the Messiah uh, and really were just following the practice. Just like just like people get up and go now down to a church and and you know they they come for the social gathering. It's good to see people, you know, friends, family, and they sing songs and they sit there and they nod off or they sit there and they pick at their fingernails and they look at their watch or, or look through their phone or do whatever they do and they wait for it to be over and then they shake everybody's hand and go spend the rest of the day doing what they want to do and they never think twice about what the preacher said They never and they go all week long. It's just a ritual, a habit. And that's kind of what Israel had gotten into. And folks, America's there too, really are. America's there too. It's just kind of a a ritual on Sunday, they go to go to church. A lot of people now don't even care anything about it. Uh, they, they've gotten totally uh, turned off by church, and I can understand it. I really can. I hate to say that, but I can. If if all you have to choose from is is a uh, worldly church, then I would say, you know what? I wouldn't want to go there either. I, I don't want to go somewhere where there's fog machines and and rock bands and words up on the wall that we just say eleven sing eleven times over and over and over. I, I don't. I, that's not church. And then the preacher gets up to preach and talks out of a another book, which is not the Bible, uh, which is, is supposed to be another Bible, but it's not another Bible because God's not a schizophrenic and He doesn't say things forty thousand different ways. I feel sorry for those people. I really do. They need to get in church. They need to get to know the one who whom church is all about. It's not it's not an appointment we have every week like going to see a doctor. Amen. It's it's a daily relationship that we're to have with Jesus Christ. And oh, if I, if there was some way I could reach in our, in each one's hearts under the sound of my voice, 
if there was some button I could push in you to stir you up, to say, you know what, starting today, I need to walk with Jesus. Starting today, I need to get to know my Lord. Starting today, I need to quit wasting time because I don't know how much of it I have left. Starting today, I want to make the most of my life. Starting today, I want to leave the things behind that have held me back all this time. Starting today, I want to, I want to exemplify to others what, who Christ is to me. Oh, if we could just do that. If we just had the desire to do that. If we, if we, if we quit, if we quit being so wrapped up in our own little world and, and realize there's more to this life than just us and what we can see, that we need to be Christ-like. We need to show Christ to others and, and have a testimony before men so that when we do share God's word with them, they'll listen to us. Jesus said, think not, in verse 17, don't think for a second that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill. Again, it had become a religious practice. Jesus did not come. And by the way, that religious practice of trying to keep, the, they were trying to keep the law, and the Pharisees would promote to those people that they were, that they were able to keep the law. They gave the impression that they were, they were actually doing it. And they weren't, they weren't admitting that they were sinners. I mean, they, they hated to admit that they were sinners. That's why they hated Jesus. That's why they crucified Jesus is because he pointed out to them that they were sinners. They hated him. Jesus didn't come to destroy it and get rid of it. He wanted them to know, look, the law is the law. God never changes when he says something. Amen? God doesn't change his mind about his law. Amen? What he said then is still true today. Amen? All the things that he said are still true today. Every law in there, God still believes that man ought to be able to keep, but man can't keep it. So God sent him a substitute. God sent him a sacrifice. God sent him a way out. The only way to please God is to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and to be in him, not our own righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ Jesus the Lord. So when God looks down at us, he doesn't see us. He doesn't see our works. He doesn't see the best we have to offer because he'd have to throw us into hell based on that because it doesn't measure up. Our righteousness can't ever get rid of our sin. Our righteousness can't take away one blemish of sin. But Jesus' blood can wash it all away, make us white as snow. And not only that, Jesus, Jesus actually gives to us his righteousness. He covers us in his righteousness so that God doesn't see ours. He sees the Lord's righteousness. He sees Jesus' righteousness in us. And Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law. And what we are learning in this, as we looked at it last week, is the Lord's trying to show, he's trying to take these commandments and say, you know, it's not just you check, going down a checklist and saying, well, I'm not, I'm not committing adultery. I haven't cheated on my wife, so I got that one. And I've never killed anybody, so I've got that one. You know, Jesus begins to expound on it and, and to go further and show them it's not just the letter of the law, it's the spirit of the law. It's what's behind it. It's the heart involved in it. As he's taught them in the Sermon on the Mount, he, he, he's teaching them what it means to be a believer. He's teaching them, uh, it's not just, again, not just going through a checklist. It's wanting to have the heart that Christ has. It's wanting to have the mind that Christ has. It's wanting to walk in his steps. When we look at Jesus Christ, what do we see? Do we see a rigid law, a law keeper who... Who, who, like the Pharisees, is so strict and hard and, and tough and fast on everything, and and, and they were they were even they were mean to people. And I mean, we see that with ultra religious uh, people today who try to be ultra religious. And when I say that, they're trying to be uh, to have a work salvation. They're very mean spirited. Okay, the Lord's not mean spirited. The Lord's full of love and compassion. Amen. But he want, But listen to me. He wants us to understand very clearly that we need him. The purpose of him teaching these things is to show us, look, we can do things and we can, we, can, uh, we can give the appearance of being good to people, but the truth of it is what goes on in our heart. What goes on in our heart is, is just as important as what we show to other people. Amen? And I, I don't have time to go back through all of it, so we're going we're gonna to kind of pick up here in verse 27, and I know we, we read some of this last week, but we're going 
We're going to read. We're going to read there, verse twenty-seven. We're going to pray first before we do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father in heaven, Lord, I love you, and I thank you, Father, for this this day that you've given us, this Lord's day. And Lord, I want to honor you today. I don't want to honor myself. I don't want to honor anybody else. I want to honor Jesus. I want to give Him glory. I want to, Lord, give glory to you by giving glory to Jesus. Lord, help me to preach. I need you today, Holy Ghost of God. I will fail without your help and your power and your your authority and Lord your delivery through me. I can't do it. Lord, I my heart my heart's not in shape this morning, Lord, to do anything. I need you 100%. Father, I just pray that that, that you'd please just transcend any limitations I might have today. And Lord, that you'd bring forth the message you want preached. Lord, I willingly give myself to you. And I ask you to cleanse me, make me a vessel that you can use. Lord, I, I, I ask you to forgive my sins. Lord God, to give me understanding and wisdom as I preach. Lord, help me to instruct and to uplift, Father. I know I can't do it. Holy Ghost of God, you do it through me. And I give you praise and glory. I thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> All right. Begin there in verse 27. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get back into where he's talking about adultery. And uh, we're just going to start there. But he said, Jesus said here in verse 27, he said, You've heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her. Doesn't say he does anything to the woman. Doesn't say he even speaks to the woman. Doesn't say that he ever put lays a finger on her. No, he just looks on her and lusts. The Bible says, you know, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Well, that lust, it, it brings the thought of, I want to do this, but I can't yet, but I want to. It's a desire that's burning in a man's heart. Or a woman's. Let's don't just leave women out on this. But both both sexes can do the same thing. God's addressing men. He said, Who, whosoever's done that, who've looked on her to lust after, hath already has committed adultery with her already in his heart. In other words, if nobody was around, and if she was a willing participant, then he would do it. The desire's there. It's just, I don't know if I can get away with it or not. But the desire's there. If there was nothing holding you back, you'd do it. That's what the desire is. It's, it's there. It's a willingness to do so. You're playing it out in your mind and thinking about how or what you would do if you could get away with it. It's the same thing with murder. The anger, that, that, that hostility in one's heart, that bitterness that drives us to, to hatred, it, 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 you say, well, I, I, I wouldn't kill him because I'd go to jail. But if you, couldn't, if you would get away with it if nobody found out, if you, if you could do it and, and nobody would ever know you did it, you'd do it. And you see, it's dangerous. It's dangerous for us to sit and mull over sin in our heart and our life. And the Lord went on to say, he said, and if thy right eye offend thee, in other words, if your right eye is causing you to sin, he said, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it's profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Jesus said, listen, if your right eye is, 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 is driving you to sin, if your right eye is doing that, you'd be better off to die with a one eye in your life than, than to not get saved, than to not come to me and get born again. And he said, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it's profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Now listen to me. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't take stealing. It doesn't, it doesn't take adultery. It doesn't take uh, grievous sins to cast somebody into hell. It just takes sin, period. Amen? And he's not talking to saved people here about this issue because, listen to me, a saved person cannot be cast into hell because Jesus said, he said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which is greater than all, uh, gave them me and, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. He said, I and my father are one. See, he's not talking about people who were saved who might, because they lusted after something, be cast into hell. He's talking about people who have never come to him, who have never been born again. All right? 
And he says, and we're going to jump into verse 31 here. I think that's where we, I'm thinking that's where we stopped last week right there. Verse 31, the Bible says, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Well, what, okay, it hath been said. Where did it say that? It said that in Deuteronomy 24.1. I'm going to turn over and read that for you real quick. Deuteronomy 24.1, where, where the... The Bible's, uh, the Bible's talking about divorce. In the Old Testament, this is, this is what the law of Moses had to say about it. I'll find it here in just a second. Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. The Bible says, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found in her some, unclean, uh, found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she's departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And uh, let's, let's, we'll stop right there. The, from what I understand from, from reading up on the subject, it, it was to the point to where Jewish men, they took a wife and, I mean, you can think it's crazy, but it's so simple as she couldn't cook. She fell out of favor in his eyes, and he, he divorced her. She couldn't cook. Or if he happened to find one he thought was prettier than her, and she fell out of favor in his eyes, he divorced her and get rid of her. I'm telling you now, I know that's crazy to think that, but that's how easy divorce had gotten for them. And Jesus is saying, hang on a minute, I want to tell you something. He said, but I'll say unto you, now listen, here's the Lord talking about it. If you ever want to know what, how does God feel about it, here's what he says. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving or except for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. <laughs> Unless that woman is having an affair, cheating, upon, cheating on her husband, God says there is no grounds for him to give her a bill of divorcement. There, 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 there's no reason for that. He's still talking about adultery here. He's saying, listen, it's not about you and what you want. It's about what I've said. He's trying to say it's about a man's heart. It's what... God wants us to be right, not just in an external way, but an internal way. He wants us to be in line with him, not just on the outside where the world can see, but in our hearts as well. So listen, it's not, it's not just a matter of, well, I haven't, I haven't crossed this line over here. Yes, but, you, but in your heart you have. Amen? Well, I haven't done that wrong, but in your heart you have. And that's the thing that matters. Listen. We're not to live to please men. Understand that. We're not to live a life and we make sure we don't do this so so so-and-so can see it and we make sure we don't do that so so so-and-so can't see it. I mean, that's not how we're to go about our life. Because I can promise you this. When you stand before God someday, what you did before so-and-so ain't going to really be a big deal. What's going to matter is what you did before God and what you did in your heart. That's what's going to matter to him, amen? It's not just the letter of the law, it's the spirit of the law, amen? And listen, you can, if you just follow the letter of the law, you'll have a cold, dead religion. You follow the spirit of the law, you'll have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? He's the embodiment of it, amen? He didn't come to destroy it, he came to fulfill it, amen? How do I, how do I, how do I live a life that pleases God? You walk with Jesus Christ. You get to know him. You let him live in your life every single day you live. And the more and the more you get closer to him, the more you get closer to him, the more he shows up, the more his presence is felt, the more you don't want to please, displease your Lord, the more it grieves you to displease him. Evil thoughts that pass through your mind. Listen, you can't keep them from showing up. I have evil thoughts. Everybody has evil thoughts. What matters is what do you do with those evil thoughts? Do you sit and relish them? As one preacher said, do you roll them around in your mouth like a hard candy on your tongue and savor every little bit of it? Is that how we deal with temptations? Is that how we deal with sin? Billy Sunday said, 
You can't keep a bird from landing on top of your head, but you can doggone sure keep it from building a nest up there. Amen. The thought may pass through your mind, but don't sit and dwell on the thought. The Bible tells us we're to cast down imaginations and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Amen. And listen, when those thoughts come, we cast them down for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. The Lord moves on to another command in verse 33. He's going to deal this time with the third commandment. Y'all know what the third commandment is? Huh? What's the third commandment? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Again, we, we've been probably taught by most people that that means don't say GD, God blanket, you know what I'm saying? I, that's, what, that, that, that's what most people think when they say, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I, I definitely recommend that you don't talk like that. I recommend, because, you know, when people say those words, they're asking God to damn something. They're asking God to cur put a curse upon something. There's power in our words, folks. That life, the Bible says life and death are in the tongue. God didn't say that flippantly, just like it didn't matter. He said that because it does matter. What we say matters. Amen? We will be measured by the words that come out of our mouths. The Bible says every idle word, every idle word will be called into account for it. Amen? That's sobering right there. I spoke a lot of them. I wish I could take back. All right, verse 33. The Bible said again, ye have heard it has been said by them of old time. Okay, who are we talking about? Well, we'd have to turn over to, to Isaiah here in just a second to hear this. All right. Again, you've heard it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. What does that mean? I, let me turn over to Isaiah. I want to read that real quickly. I'm sure we're going to repeat it, but I want to read it in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 66 in verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build me, and where is the, the place of my rest? Well, let's focus on those first two statements. The heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. That kind of sounds like the earth the center of the universe, doesn't it? I don't care what science says. The Bible talks about science falsely so-called, amen? Earth the center of the universe. God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't say God, and God created Mars, and God created Venus and Jupiter and all that. No, it just talks about lights in the heavens, amen? It says God created the heaven and the earth, amen? And the heavens is thrown, the earth is his footstool. All right? So we've, been heard, we've heard that it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oath. What does that mean? The, we, we shall, we shall uh, perform unto the Lord thine oath. Do you realize, and I know this is a scary thing when you think about it, but I wonder how many times we've ever been down at an altar in a church and we have knelt down and made God some promises. I said, Lord, Lord, if you'll, just, if you'll just allow this to happen, Lord, I swear to you, I'll... I'll follow you. I'll, 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 I'll follow your word. Oh, Lord, please, if you'll just fix this situation in my life, oh, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I wonder if we've ever said anything like that to God. Do you know that you're bound by your words? God never forgets what you said. It's true. God heard you. God remembers, and God expects you to follow what you said. Amen. That's scary, isn't it? I don't, I don't even remember all them times I said stuff like that, y'all. No, God does. Amen. He said, but I say unto you, Jesus said, I, but I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne. I swear to, I swear to God, just sure he's up there. You're sure there's a heaven above. I swear. People talk like that. That's what he's talking about. We shouldn't do that. 
Amen. We should not ever do that. He said, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. I swear, as long as this earth stands, well, we shouldn't do that either. He said, neither by Jerusalem. You know, that has to do with Jews. I understand that. That, that. that has nothing to do with us living in America right now. But the Jews, now why does God address this? Because the Jews were quick to swear by things. That, just to let others know, listen, I'm serious about this. I'll swear by Jerusalem. You know, they they swear by the by the by the altar and the temple and Jerusalem. I'll I'll swear upon all those things. It's like those things are holy, so I'll swear by those to show you I'm serious. God says no. Christ says no. You don't swear by those things. Those aren't yours to swear by. We're not to swear by. Listen, heaven's not ours to swear by. How can we swear by that and give an oath based on that? We can't do that. God says that's not. We're not to do that. That's that's doing something uh, totally against God when we do that. He said, neither shall thou swear by thy head. Because thou can't, he said, thou canst make, canst not make one hair black or white. That shows us just how pitiful we are. We're so powerless, we don't even have power and authority over one of our hairs on our head. Now, I know a beautician might say, well, I can too make my hair black. <laughs> no, you can't. Because when it grows three, uh, grows about a week later, you'll see you didn't change it. All you did is put something on top of it. Amen? I don't care how much color you put in the white hair, it's going to come out white when it grows. You can't change what it is. We don't have... Considering we don't have that very much authority and we don't have very much power in this life, our power is, is derived from our, our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the power comes from in our life. I mean, we don't, we, don't, we don't have any authority in this world except for God's authority. We don't have any power in this world except for God's power. And seeing as how that's the way it is, then we have a responsibility, a duty, and an obligation to God, and if we want to have any power in this life, if we want to have any authority in this world, it'll be because we're walking and talking with Him and speaking His words and His truth and walking in His truth. That's the only place any of that's going to come from. He says, let your co communication be yea, yea, and nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. So to say, I swear to God, I swear to God, I'll see it happen, I swear to God. Listen, you're, you're doing something evil, God says. We shouldn't talk like that. I've heard people say, I swear on my mama's grave. You shouldn't do that either. You don't, he said, well, what about if you got to go to court? Can we swear upon the authority of the Word of God? That's not taking a, a light oath. Is it, is, it, is it unlawful to put your hand upon the Word of God and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I don't know. But God says, let your communication. When we talk to people, a man's word ought to be his bond. Amen? It should be. If you tell somebody, yes, I will do what you ask, you don't have to say, I swear to you I will. No. I, I, you know, I swear, for, I, I, what you're saying is, you, sw you swear, you know, based on something else, you're saying on that authority. There ain't no authority there. Listen, let's not pretend to be something we're not. Let's not use language that, that binds us by something that God never intended us to bind ourselves with. Listen, we ought to just be honest with people, speak honestly and truthfully. <laughs> yay, yay means Absolutely yes. No, nay, nay, absolutely not. It's not saying that we're swearing some oath. We're not. We're just to answer and be truthful and always speak the truth to other people. Amen? But when we are doing anything other than that, and we, we're, we're swearing by anything, we're taking God's name in vain. Amen? Just as, a, as a believer even, and I, and I want to say this too, as a believer... If we are promoting ourselves to be a Christian and our life don't back up what we're living, then we're swearing something ain't true. Don't swear to the world you're a Christian, amen? Don't tell the world you're a Christian and don't live like one. 
Amen? We're dishonoring God with that. Amen? Don't dishonor God. Don't carry, drag His name around. Don't drag God's name through the mud. You're dishonoring Him with that. And then we move on to verse 38. We're going to finish this chapter today. In verse 38, we, we're going to begin where, where God is, is talking about retaliation. <laughs> it's a very human, basic instinct in a human being. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. You thump me, I'm going to thump you back. You poke me, I'm going to poke you back. You slap me, I'm going to slap you back. You punch me, I'm going to punch you back. You pinch me, I'm going to pinch you back. We grew up doing it as kids. One one sibling goes into the other one's room, does something mean to them, and they come running across the hall back into the other one's room, getting them back, and Mama gets mad, comes in there, and both of them get in trouble. This, we've learned to do that growing up. But that's not God's way. That's human nature. <clears throat> Verse 38 says, You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. That's Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 21. Deuteronomy 19, verse 21. I'm going to read that to you. Deuteronomy 19, verse 21. The Bible says, And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Jesus said, You've heard that it hath been said, eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. In other words, you do it, you're going to get it back. Right? You steal, we're going to take from you. You kill somebody, you're going to be killed. You put somebody's eye out, we're going to put your eye out. Jesus said, but I say unto you that you resist, not evil. What? What, Jesus? That don't make no sense. What? Resist, not evil? Well, evil's going to win if we resist, not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. So he hauls off and pops you on one cheek. Jesus said, don't you get mad and backhand him. You turn to him the other one. Here, here's my other cheek. I don't make, it doesn't make sense to a natural man. Natural man's anger flares up in him. That's where man's pride jumps up and says, how dare you slap me? Don't you know who I am? I'm a grown man. I didn't get grown by letting people slap me. I'm ready to haul off and knock your block off. That's natural man. So well, how's that Christ like? Well, I remember Jesus. When they, when they brought him in, he didn't answer for himself. When they, when they took him and they beat him with their fists, he didn't fight back. When they put the crown of thorns on his head, he didn't try to take it back off. When they, when they took him and they tied him up and they whipped him and they tore his flesh all apart, he didn't, he didn't lash out at them in anger and swear to destroy them in hell. He didn't do any of those things. When they took him, they nailed him to the cross and they hung him up between heaven and earth to die. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. That's hard for me to grasp. But that's the forgiveness of the Lord. That's the forgiveness of the Lord. That's God's grace. And you and I as believers, we're to let Christ live and walk and breathe in us. And if we do that, we're going to have to carry that same spirit in us and exemplify that, to show that to other people that Christ is in us. And how do we do that? It's not by getting back at people and hurting them and doing to them what they're doing to us. It's by loving them in spite of what they've done to us. If any man will sue thee at the law, let him take away thy coat and take away thy coat let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain or two. You see, a Roman soldier could ride up on a horse and tell a Jew to come with him. And he could make him 
carry his stuff one mile. That was, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that was the law. Conscript somebody to go and 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 carry his carry his belongings, carry his sack with him a mile. But Jesus said, "No, if that happens, don't just say, well, 'Well, I towed it one mile and I'm dropping it there.'" Jesus said, "Go and carry it another mile." You said, second mile is that grace mile." He had the the first the first mile is that law mile. Well, I've got to, I've got to do it. So I'll carry that bag because the law says I have to. Jesus said, don't just show them law. Show them grace. Show them, hey, I'm, I'm not doing this because you told me to. I'm doing this one, this mile, because I want to. Because I want to show you that I, that I don't hate you for making me do it. Matter of fact, I'm going to do this mile out of love. Why are you doing that? Because the Lord loves me and I love him too. And I want to show the love of the Lord to other people. That's why. Because they can't see it if all I'm doing is following the letter of the law. Amen? Listen, you couldn't see God's love in those Pharisees. All they're doing is, is ticky-tack following the letter of the law and showing everybody, I'm following the letter of the law. Jesus said, Jesus is showing us that doesn't demonstrate God's love. What demonstrates God's love is going above and beyond, being willing to be compassionate on those who don't deserve compassion, and being willing to, to show love to those who are unlovely. He said, give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Now, I, I read this, and I think to myself, does that mean that, you know, if, if that I'm just to give away everything I have every day, all day long, and, and, and just be taken advantage of at every turn? I don't believe that's what the Lord's trying to say. But I believe when the, when the, when the Lord is talking about somebody that's in need, it's not for me to decide whether, what they're going to do with what they need. Okay? If somebody, if you see somebody, if you see somebody uh, with, with a sign that says they, they 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 hadn't eaten a long time, they need help. And, and you know what? If God puts it on your heart to give to them, and you give to them, and they leave your presence, and they go immediately to the liquor store, and they buy a six pack of beer, and they go sit under a tree and get get drunk. Listen, you say, well, I, God would honor that. God didn't honor what they did with it. God honored what you did with it. Amen? God will deal with them for what they did with your gift, but God's not going to hold you accountable for what they did. God just wants us to show the love of Christ. You see, what does the Bible say? I'll paraphrase, but it says when we do good or we do act of kindness to those that hate us, it's as if we're heaping hot coals of fire upon their head. They don't understand it. They can't figure out why we're doing that. It doesn't make any logical sense. They can't, it just blows their mind. Why would they treat me this way? I am nothing but mean to them, or I don't deserve it, and they're, they're loving me anyway. It, it, what? It, it just like short circuits them. Amen? Listen, <clears throat> it overwhelms to be loved like that. It overwhelms a person to be loved when they don't deserve it, to be shown mercy when they don't deserve mercy, to be given grace when they don't deserve grace. That's what grace is. It's undeserved. And I can tell you today that when I was, when I was seven years old and I realized I was a lost sinner and when Jesus saved me and set me free, I didn't deserve it. I still don't deserve it. I don't deserve to have the things I have. I don't deserve to... to, to, to experience the things I experience, God has been very gracious to me in this life. I don't deserve any of it. And that's the way God wants me to be with other people. God wants me to show that same kind of love to others around me that don't deserve it. In verse 43, he said, You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Verse 43, let's see, that's, that's Leviticus 19.18. I'm going to turn over there and read that. Leviticus 19.18. Let 
All right, hang on just a second. Let me find this. Okay, when I, that's that's the one where it says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor. Okay, verse 19, 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. That's what he said there. Now, let's find the other one where he said, And hate thine enemies. Um, 43, let's see. That would be Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy 23, 3 through 6. All right. An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to their tenth generation, but shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever, because they met you not with bread or water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor, of, of Pethor, of Mesopotamia, to curse thee, Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, and because the Lord thy God loved thee, thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all the days forever. But Jesus said, now look here. He said, you've heard thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Love your enemy. Why, why do I still love my enemy? Because my enemy's lost, more than likely. My enemy hates God. My enemy hates me because I love God. It's a hard one, isn't it? Let me tell you something. That takes growth in the Lord. You don't just you don't just wake up. You don't get saved and then wake up and just do that. It takes growth. That takes that takes pre- that takes the presence of Jesus Christ. Most of us, listen. I, I hate to say this, but most of us have not walked with the Lord far enough to experience being able to love your enemy. Or most of us have never been put in a situation where we have to love an enemy. This there may come a day, sometime, folks. Uh, right now, we're in the land of the free and the home of the brave, right? But there may come a day, sometime, when we're surrounded by the enemy. And it may be that we have to love that enemy, even though we don't want to love that enemy. He says, love your enemies. How do you love an enemy? Well, you try to get them to come to Christ. You try, you show them by not, by not retaliating against them, by not trying to destroy them. You show them through kindness that the Lord loves them. I, I couldn't do that. No, I couldn't either. I could. I'm just telling you the truth. I couldn't do that. But he can. If if it's up to me, it won't happen. If it's up to me, I'd rather kill the enemy than, than love them. But that's not what God wants me to do. You see, that's my natural man talking there. The natural man, the natural body that that carries my soul and my spirit around would would lash out. But I don't want to live my life based on what my human feelings are. I don't want to live my life based on what my natural self says to do. I want to live my life in order to, to, to honor the Lord God with my life. And if I do that, I can't be full of hate. I can't be full of retaliation. I can't I can't be full of I'm gonna get you no matter what. No, God says you gotta put that away. You've got to love them even though they hate you. He says, bless them that curse you. It's hard too. They curse you. Hey, they wish harm to you. They call you horrible names. They say ugly things to you. And the natural man says, well, you know what? Well, I'm not going to say what I, what I would want to say. I'm not going to say those things because those things are not God-honoring and they're not proper to say. But what I want to do, I want to lash out and scream curse words back at them. That's what my natural flesh wants to do when somebody curses at me. That's not godly. I want to honor my Savior. Matter of fact, it'll put an ugly smear on my testimony. 
What do I do in that moment? How do I handle that? I have to turn to God and I say, God, you got to live through me. You've got you to show up in me, Lord. You've got to handle this. I can't. The only way I can do that is if I get close to Jesus. That's the only way it's humanly possible. It's not humanly possible. It's, it's, it's supernaturally possible. The only way I can do that is to turn it over to him. And say, I have to pray for them. I have to love them. I have to bless them. So, and how, the only way they can be blessed, listen, how do I bless somebody who's cursing me? The only way I can bless them is to ask God to touch their life. Is to ask God to do something. Because there ain't no blessing outside of God. This world can't bless you. So, well, I could be given lots of things and lots of money. That's not blessing. Blessing or, or uh, blessing, true blessings are things that come from God. Amen. That the Bible tells us that every every good thing and every perfect thing cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. The blessings of life come from God. So if I bless somebody that's cursing me, I've got to wish God's favor upon them. I've got to wish God to do something great in their life. So I'm, I'm wanting them to be saved. I'm wanting them to get right with God. I'm not wanting them to continue on in their wickedness. And he says, and, and do good to them that hate you. And, and do good to them that hate me? Man, that's tough. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. Jesus was pronouncing a blessing upon those who were killing him. When did that blessing hit? Do y'all know? Do you know those weren't empty words? When Jesus Christ said... Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Do you know that Jesus' prayer was answered? Certainly was. On the day of Pentecost, over 3,000 people got saved there that day. Do you realize that those same people were some of those who stood there at the cross and mocked? Some of those people were ones who hated him before. Jesus' prayer was answered. Now, now, I don't imagine every one of them got saved. But you know, I bet some of them did. Do good to them that hate you. Jesus could have Jesus took his salvation and went to heaven with it and said, forget them. But he was willing to give them eternal life. What can we do? In that regard, to somebody that hates us, we can share with them Jesus. So what? They might hurt me. Well, they might. They hurt him too. So, man, being Christian is tough. It is. But, but the Lord makes it a whole lot easier. See, his burden's, his burden's easy. His burden's light, the Bible says. So... Unless he's telling me a story, if I do these things, which look hard to my flesh, if I begin to do them in his power, I'll find out they're not that hard to do. It's not that hard to love somebody who don't deserve to be loved. It's not that hard to do something good to somebody that don't deserve to be treated right. It's not that hard to, to bless somebody that's cursing me. It's not that hard to pray for somebody who despitefully uses me. They do it out of spite. They use me out of spite. That means they hate me and they would wish they could hurt me. And they, they do things to put me in a situation and, and, and that, that takes advantage of me for whatever reason because they dislike me or whatever. God says, instead of sitting there thinking about how I'm going to get even with them, I'm going to pray for them. What do you call that? It's called brotherly love. Notice verse 45, what he says. That ye may be the children of your Father 
which is in heaven. So if I'm not if I'm not loving my enemy, if I'm not blessing those that are cursing me, if I'm not doing good to those that hate me, if I'm not praying for those that persecute me and despite, despitefully use me, then I'm not being the children of my Father in heaven. I'm not acting like a child of God. I'm acting like a child of the, of the devil. I'm acting like a child of this world. I'm not demonstrating to other people what a Christian is supposed to be and what a Christian is supposed to look like. He said, man, this is tough. That's yeah, tough. But it's, it's true. Just because something is, it, you, maybe we've never done it right before don't mean it's wrong. It just means we've been wrong. You see, the Bible says, For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. In other words, God, God didn't, I mean, listen, when my, when, when my grass and my plants need rain, God doesn't just let it rain over here, and the wicked man down the street, he's in a drought. God doesn't do that. He sends that rain right over that wicked man's house, too. He gets the rain just like I do. I mean, he, 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 he makes the sun come up and shine on his plants and, and, and makes the sun shine on his, his family just like he does mine. God, God's not holding one thing back from everybody. He's giving the same thing to everybody. Listen, he's not willing that any should perish. That means any. That encompasses every single person that ever drew a breath ever in the history of the world and ever will. He did not look at some and say, you're better than others. He looked at all of us, this whole sin-sick humanity, just like Christ came down the hill and saw all these sin-sick people who were at the bottom of it, and he had compassion. The Bible said he healed them all. God would heal us all. He'd give us all salvation if we'd all turn to him and believe on Christ. There's none that deserves it more than others. He said, for if you love them which love you, what reward have you? It's easy to love somebody who loves you. It's easy to be good to somebody that's good to you. I mean, that doesn't take much effort. I mean, you want to love people that love you. It's natural. He said, do not even the publicans the same? I'll never forget. I was watching a documentary one time, and it was a strange documentary. It was about people that go around to these massive, uh, uh, I guess, like flea markets, and, and uh, they, 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 they search through old pictures. A lot of, I guess, big city flea markets, they're, they're old black and white photos just in boxes and things of that nature. And these people were going and filing through all these, in these big cities, they were looking. There were different ones looking for different things. There was the one who, who had lost all his family and lost all his family albums, and he'd look through there looking for pictures of people that looked reminded him of his relatives, and he was building a photo album based on, on uh, people that looked like his family members because he didn't have any pictures of his family. But there was this other fellow, and he was searching for old Nazi family photos. He collected Nazi family photos strange but in all these family photos of these nazi war criminals these ss soldiers who would work in the death camps and and just be absolutely merciless toward the jews and and and, and treat them with cruelty and and murder them in cold blood in their family photos they're all gathered up with their wife and their children they're all smiling they look so nice and friendly you see they're good to their family. Even the publicans love those that love them. Those Nazis love those that love them. That's, that's, that's natural. But can I tell you something? There were some Jews in those concentration camps. You take Corey Ten Boom, for example, who wrote the book The Hiding Place trying to show the love of Christ to those who were her captors. That's Christ's love. In the face of that, Richard Wormbrand, who was in Romania, held captive by, by, by Soviet captors, who was cruel and, and horrible to them, 
yet they loved their captors. You see, that's Christ-like. We've never experienced anything like that. We don't have a point of reference for that. But folks, I'm going to tell you something. Even though we're not imprisoned by people, even though we're not held captive by people, we're mistreated by people. And when we're mistreated by people, we have an opportunity to show back Jesus' love. He said, if you salute your brethren only, if we're only good and say hi and kind to those who are close to us, he said, what do you more than others? Do not even publicans so? If that's all we do is, is, is just be kind to those who are kind to us, we're not demonstrating Christ's love at all. We have got to step out our little box and show other people that Jesus loves them. Take time to invest in somebody who you wouldn't normally invest in. And I want to finish up with this right here. He says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Well, Jesus, that's hard. I'm nothing like the Father. That's incredibly hard for me to even consider to be to be like God. But I want you to understand something. He's not expecting us to be sin free. But what he wants us to be is mature. Christ wants us to grow up in him. Quit being spiritual babies. We're going to have to exercise our faith to get stronger. We're going to have to walk with Jesus. You know, walking is good exercise. If we'd walk with Jesus every day, we would exercise our spiritual muscles. We would get stronger, and when we look at these things he's asking us to do, we wouldn't say, whew, that looks like, I mean, that's like a man walking up and somebody saying, well, you're fixing to lift 400 pounds. I can't do that. That's too much for me. You're putting more on me than I can lift. I can't today. I could probably lift 120 of it. Probably maybe even lift 150 of it. Maybe, I don't know, I might get close to 200, but I can tell you this. You get up a little bit above that, I can't lift it. I'm not that strong. Maybe I once was, but I'm not anymore. But what will happen if, if, I, if I lift that, what I can lift, I lift it today and lift it tomorrow and lift it next week. And, and, and before long, you can put five more pounds on. Before long, you can add ten more pounds. Before long, you can throw another 25 on there. And little by little, I'll build muscle until I'm able to lift 400 pounds. It's possible that it can happen. Even though right now, it could be a lofty goal for me. But I can assure you this, it's possible. And you look at these things that the Lord has said to us to do, and we say, I couldn't do that. I don't know how I could do that. I, I couldn't do that to every, everybody everywhere. I mean, their people are horrible. Just start trying. Just ask God for strength to do it just a little. Just a little bit outside of what you've been doing. Just, Lord, Lord, Give me an opportunity to do this, the things you've shown me today, the things you've told me today. I don't want to just be one who just goes around checking off a checklist. Well, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing this. I'm not being mean to nobody. I'm not being cruel to nobody. But you're, we're not going above and beyond trying to love somebody that it's not easy to love either. Lord, please give me an opportunity to show other people what you've done in my life. God, please give me an opportunity to show other people what what it means to have unconditional love. God, please give me an opportunity to do something kind to somebody that's mean to me. Please, Lord, open that avenue of opportunity. Does that mean you need to welcome, welcome them in and let them run over you every day you live? No, but you can show them that Christ still loves. Amen? Be therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Psalm thirty seven thirty seven. I'm gonna read that real quick. Psalm thirty seven thirty seven. The Bible says, "Mark the perfect man." In other words, pay attention to the man who is grown up and complete in the Lord. 
and behold the upright. Watch him. For the end of that man is peace. Hear what I just said. Jesus just told us how to be a perfect man. You see that? He said you, you'll do it by, by loving those who are unlovely. You'll do that by, by not revenge, by not having revenge against people. You'll get that by showing brotherly love to people. You'll get that by not letting lust rule your life and confess her and, cre- and create desires in you which lead to lust, which leads to sin, which leads to you absolutely destroying your testimony. Listen, he says... Mark that man. Watch that man. Pay attention to the man who's mature and grown up in the Lord. That man's life is full of peace. How can I be peaceful, Lord, if I'm loving people who hate me and all this stuff? There's a peace that passeth all understanding. See, your natural mind can't grasp these things. Your natural mind says, I could never do that. You're right. You can't, but he will. He has already. The same Jesus who hung upon Calvary and cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, is the same Jesus who lived in Stephen, who stood there in that, down in that pit that day when they were bashing his head in with stones and cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Jesus stood up off the throne cheering for Stephen. Listen, that same Jesus lived in every martyr who ever died a martyr's death. That same Jesus lives in me and lives in you, and he wants to show up every day in us and give us peace that we don't have in this world. Philippians chapter 3, 12 through 15. Philippians 3, 12 through 15. Paul said, not as though I had already attained. I'm not where I ought to be yet. Even Either we're already perfect. I'm not completely grown up either. He said, but I follow after. I'm, I'm pursuing that. I, I, I'm, I'm pursuing Christ-like behavior. That's my goal. I'm not there yet. I'm not claiming that I got it, everything tacked down, everything filled out right yet, but that's where I'm headed. You see, God doesn't expect us to throw a switch. Babies don't walk when they come out the womb. They gotta learn to crawl. They gotta learn to pull up on something before they can ever take that first step and get their balance. God's not expecting you tomorrow to walk out and be and be the greatest Christian that's ever lived. But you know what? You can take a little baby step and head in the right direction. He said, "Listen, I, I, he said I follow after. I'm pursuing after it. If that I may apprehend or get my hands on that." for which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. He said, I'm pursuing. I'm pursuing I'm pursuing being a grown-up, mature Christian so that he can get a hold of me, or so that I can get a hold of him like he's got a hold of me. I want to I understand who Jesus is. I want to get to know Jesus. That's what Paul's saying. You understand that? I want to get to know him in his fullness so that he lives through me and in me every single day that I live. And he says, he said, Brethren, I, I count not myself to have apprehended. I hadn't got there yet. He said, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, that's his flesh, forgetting the way I used to be, forgetting the way I used to treat people and the way I used to do things. He persecuted people. This is, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He presented to the world that he was outwardly perfect. All the while, he was inwardly wicked. He said, listen, I want to get a hold of of him. I want to, I want him to fill my life. I'm not grown up yet, but I want to be. He said, I forget the things which are behind. I forget the way I used to look at the world. I forget the way I used to handle things. He said, and I'm reaching forth unto those things which are before. First Peter chapter one, fifteen and sixteen. First Peter chapter one, fifteen and sixteen. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation that is in every area of your life. <clears throat> See, God, God doesn't, God doesn't uh, say, well, draw a circle around Sunday, and that'll be your spiritual life. And then the rest of it, you can go and do what you want to, as long as you come back to this little circle on Sunday. Everything else will be all right. That's not how God intends for us to live our Christian life. God wants us to live not a circle around Sunday, but a circle around our whole life, and it's filled with God.
But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. In other words, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Be ye holy, for I, as I am holy. Listen, I, I, I got children, but I don't want them to, I don't want them to cast off everything they've ever been taught and go uh, turn out to be a Muslim somewhere and want to kill Christians. I mean, listen, that would be horrible. I don't want them to go off and be a criminal and spend the rest of their life in jail. I don't want them to totally go opposite of the way I've trained them up to be. God never saved somebody to go and be what they want to be. God never saved somebody to go and live a life without him. God never saved somebody to go and live a life full of revenge, to go and live a life full of bitterness and hatred and, and wickedness and sin. God doesn't save somebody to live like that. God saves us to get close to Jesus, to let him fill our life and mature us and grow us up and give us peace and so that we're able to show other people that he is alive and living in us. And I'm going to close with this, Ephesians 5, 1 through 2. Ephesians chapter 5, 1 through 2. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. That's how. Say, so how do I walk in love? Do it like Christ did it. You walk in love. That means to live a life. Every day, your life is guided. Your life is based upon. Your life is manifested from the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for you. That's what it's supposed to be about. And hath given himself for us for an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Jesus laying his life down for us as an offering for, for us was pleasing to God the Father. It pleased God the Father to no end for Jesus Christ to lay his life down for us and die for our sins and be our Savior. And it pleases God to no end when we lay our lives down for Christ and say, I'm not going to do it my way anymore. I want Jesus to live through me. I want others to know that he lives. Does that mean you're going to get along with everybody in this life? No. Does that mean that, does that mean that, that you got to just be run over like a steamroller every day you live? No. But I can tell you what it does mean. It means, it means if instead of letting our flesh handle our problems of life, instead of letting our, our fleshly wisdom take control of every situation in life and, and guide us, if we would stop doing what our natural instinct is to do and think and remember and pray and ask God, then God will give us the grace and the strength and the wisdom to choose the right path and, and, and show other people that we are not just like them, that we have something different that separates us from the rest of this world and have an, exam an opportunity to be an example, have an opportunity to have a living, breathing testimony before other people that Jesus Christ not only lives, but lives in us. And in doing so, day by day, we grow stronger. We grow more mature. We grow wiser until we get to the point to where we are what God calls perfect, not sin-free, but we are mature in the ways of God. We, we understand how to walk with Jesus. We're not falling down constantly and bunging ourselves up. Like a, like a baby will do when he's learning how to walk. No, we're able to walk upright now. We're able to take steps. We're able to avoid the evil. We're able to, 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 to let the Lord fight our battles. We're able to love people that don't deserve it. We're able to, to show mercy to those who are, who, are, who are in need of it. Don't 
Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Not as unruly children, but as dear children. Dear children want to be obedient. Dear children are, are, are ones who, who it would grieve their soul to know they displeased mom and dad. They don't want to upset mom and dad. They want mom and dad to be pleased with them. That's dear children. Listen, a, a dear child of God doesn't want to upset God the Father. A dear child of God wants to, to honor Christ in their life. And they seek to find out what to do in order to, to honor him. I can tell you this, as, as a father today on Father's Day, there's nothing I want any more from my children for them to walk in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I want. That they walk in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the greatest present I could ever have. That they honor God and they, they, they believe this book and they follow this book. That's the greatest Father's Day gift I could ever get from any of them. And I want to honor God the Father with my life. I want you to honor God the Father with your life. Not because, not not in not in trying to to uh, please other people, but to please Him. The Bible see the Bible says, "When a man's ways please the Lord, He maketh even his enemies to be at peace with Him." Now, how is that possible? Because it's hard to be against somebody who keeps loving you. Amen? If you're loving your enemies, it's hard to hate somebody loving you. They'll basically say, there's no use in fighting against this person. All I'm going to get back is love. You defeat them with love. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, I need you. And I thank you, Lord, that you give us wisdom. Lord, help us to use it. Help us, Lord, to, to meditate on these things. Lord, you're right, even though even though sometimes we can't understand it. Father, your 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 way is perfect, even though our human minds can't comprehend it sometimes because of stubbornness. Lord God, I just pray for those who are enemies. Lord of, of my own personal self, or Lord of this church, or or simply Christ and the Word of God. Lord, I pray for the enemies who come against us, Lord, give us grace to be merciful. Lord God, I pray that you'd help us to grow little by little, just like a like I said today, Lord, like a baby learning to walk. Lord, teach us to walk with Christ, to get to know him, to let Jesus shine through our life. And Lord, please bless us this week as we go out into this world to live for you. Father, I pray that you'd guide our steps. Lord, we begin to step out of the way. If we begin to turn to the right hand or to the left. Holy Spirit of God, make it plain to us. Warn us. Lord, lest we go out of the way and find ourselves wandering from God. Lord, if we've made promises to you, if we've, if we've made an oath and swore to you that we would do something for you, Father, remind us that we might be able to set ourselves to doing it. Father, I just pray that you please would, would bless us now and help us. In Jesus' name we ask these things and for his sake. Amen.